all of the ministers and all of the saints for allowing us the privilege and the opportunity to be with you this week. It has been our privilege. And I appreciate most of all the presence of the Lord. We cannot do anything worthwhile without the Lord. And it's made my heart glad to have the opportunity of being in this city, in this state, and with this fine church. My heart was thrilled today to hear your fine superintendent bring the word of God just like it is in the Bible. Hallelujah. Thank God that there are some that are going to preach it without fear or favor until the Lord comes back. You have fine leadership in your district, fine group of ministers, great bunch of saints, flock of saints, I should have said, a great spirit of God moving in your midst. I see nothing in the world to keep you from growing and growing and growing. Every church ought to grow, hallelujah. Every church will grow if you'll just do it the way the Lord wants you to do it. And God is with us, and if God be for us, who can be against us? You know, sometimes we are our very own worst enemy. But if we'll use what the Lord's given us, I assure you that he will multiply those of us that are here tonight will grow into others and they'll grow into others and they'll grow into others. If every one of you saves one between now and next year, you'll double your size. That's not very many to save, just one. And then each next year save one. There's nothing can stop the church of the living God. I've enjoyed the preaching and the teaching that I've heard. I've certainly appreciated Brother Pounder's message from day to day. Thank God for this man of God he teaches the word of the Lord and preaches a message that's Bible ordained. And the word of God will never fail. Don't forget this. That when all of heaven and all of earth has passed away, the word of God will still be standing. Amen. So I'm going to tie my ship to the word of God. Amen. And again, thank you for everything that you've done for us to make our stay so enjoyable and so comforting. We're turning tonight to the third chapter of Ephesians. I'd like to read several verses beginning with verse 13. I'd like to make a request of everybody that's here tonight without exception. I'd like to ask you to search down deep in your heart and purpose in your heart that you're going to let God have his way with you in this service tonight. Hallelujah. I feel that before this service is ended, God will have spoken to a number of people here and that he will have convicted you of some things that he's going to charge you with the responsibility of getting done in the next few months, in the next year or two. I feel it. I believe he'll do it. And all I ask you is that you accept that responsibility here tonight and tell God, I don't see how and I don't see the way, but I know you're telling me and I know you're speaking to me. And Lord, by the help of God, I'm going to do it. Not by my own might and power, but by the might of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3 and 13, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, 
that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And I repeat verse 20. Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. I want you to repeat with me. Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Thank you for the word of God tonight. Lord, you've given us your word. Praise God, and we believe it right now. Lord, we believe you, and we trust you, and we know, God, tonight that you are with us. And Lord God, we're trusting in the power of the living God tonight to move in a mighty way with the power of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. And you may be seated. I'd like to read two verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And God has chosen the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to nothing things that are. And I'd like to choose my subject tonight to speak from, from the 20th verse of chapter 3 of Ephesians. I'd like to choose from my subject with the help of the Lord, God Unlimited. God Unlimited. There is a passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2 where the Apostle Paul said that he knew a man that ascended into the third heavens. He said whether he was in the body or out, he could not tell. But he said he saw things which were unlawful to utter. And I'm made to think by the reading of the passage that it was the Apostle Paul who ascended there. Things that he could not tell that he saw. And in my thinking, if the first heaven is where the birds fly, where the airplanes fly, and the second heaven is where the space bodies dwell, even beyond their own solar system, then beyond all of that is that third heaven. It does seem that this would be the case. And if it is, I'd like for us just to think for a few minutes before I get into this message tonight what we're dealing with. Now remember, Paul said he went there, or the man went there and came back. We'll assume that it was Paul. He went there and he came back. And if the third heaven is beyond the space heavens, and I believe it is, it gives us something to think about tonight. Think for a moment, first of all, of Earth's enormous sun. We're a long way from it. And if our sun were hollow, it would contain more than one million worlds the size we're living in tonight. It would be large enough you could just dump one million worlds like Earth over into the sun if it were hollow. 
And yet, up there in that space, it is said that there are ten octillion stars that are still larger than our sun. In fact, we're told that many of those suns could hold 600 million of our suns. A million Earths to make up one sun and 600 million of our suns to make up one of those large stars hanging up there in the heavens. I only say this tonight to give us an idea of how small we really are and how weak we really are and how insignificant we are. Sometimes we get to feeling so important. But we are nothing. We're less than nothing. We're less than the drop in a bucket. All of the people in this world, the Bible said it, we're less than the dust of the balance. Examine the atom, if you will, which is the basic building block of the universe. Did you know that atoms are so tiny that it takes 150 million of them to measure only one inch? God has made things in such a marvelous way. He did it for his own glory. He chose to do this because he didn't want us to depend upon ourselves. He wants us to believe upon him. Let's suppose for just about three minutes tonight, or four, that we all are going to take a trip in space. And in our imaginary spaceship, we blast off at 186,000 miles per second, which is the speed of light. In one and three-tenths seconds after the blast off, we pass the moon. In one and three-tenths seconds, mind you, after blasting off of Earth, we flash by the moon just like that. Those astronauts thought they were traveling fast. They ran over there in about three days. But man, if you travel at the speed of, of light, you can make it in less than two seconds. And then traveling at that speed, 660 million miles an hour, we'd fly out of this solar system in five hours, really getting on the way, getting far along. In four years, we'd reach the nearest star outside of our solar system. And we'd, we'd arrive at a new star every five years. Remember, we're traveling at 660 million miles an hour. In the Milky Way alone, there's over a hundred billion stars. And if we journey directly across it and never stop and just wave hello and goodbye at them as we go by, we'll be 80,000 years older when we pass the last one. And if we were to take the time to visit everyone in the Milky Way, it would take 500 billion years. Now we're in space, the second heaven. But remember this, when we would spend 500 billion years, our trip would have just begun, we would have closed the door and put one foot out on the top step on our visit. And Paul said he went to the third heavens. And I don't dispute it. I believe it. But he didn't go there by jet fuel. He didn't go there by an airplane. He went there because he was serving God who is unlimited. God unlimited. If we could fathom in our minds, in our small, finite, terrestrial minds tonight, just how insignificant we are and how much we need God and how much we must depend on God and without Him we can do nothing. You couldn't even shout and talk in tongues were it not for God. If we could just get a picture of how great and unlimited he is tonight and how much he really means to us, we'd go out of this place a new creature tonight. Amen. Every one of us would. 
Now, I want to preach about God unlimited, if the Lord would help me for a little while. God's might is revealed in small things, as we've already read in the scripture tonight. Think about a few things, for example. Think about Abel's offering. Abel's offering was small in a great big world. There was something about that offering that caught the attention of a holy God. And that God accepted that offering insomuch that he let the very fire of God consume it and receive it to himself. God was pleased with it. It was a small thing. Even the ark that Noah built, it was really a small thing compared to space and what the kingdom of God is. But yet it was a giant undertaking that took him 120 years in the building of it. But God honored it in such a way that he saved Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. Somebody said it was the ark that saved them. I don't believe that. I believe it's the unlimited power of God that saved them. I wouldn't want the job today of building an ark and putting two of every living beast on this earth in it. Brother, you get out and start rounding up some elephants and some lions and some tigers. Amen. And you'll see how much of the power of God you're going to need. It's going to take the power of God to fill up an ark that size. And I doubt if very many people could get it done. But I'll say this, if a man had the favor of God in his life and God told him to do it, they'd come marching in the ark just like he said to do it. God unlimited, hallelujah. And think about Abraham and all of his feeble efforts. And those efforts were the best he had, but he was still a man. But somehow, through it all, the word of God calls him the father of the faithful. And he was seeking a city whose builder and maker was God. The Bible said he did not stumble at unbelief. Oh God, I wish you'd let us tonight, every man and woman, boy and girl, in this tabernacle tonight, I wish, Lord, that you would get us over our stumbling here tonight and let us, oh God, see a vision through that hole that reaches to glory, and Lord, we'd be able to see you there with an outstretched hand and see our God unlimited. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then consider Jacob. He lay out on the hillside one night on his way to visit his mother's brother. And there he made God a promise. He said, if you'll bring me by this way again, bring me in peace. He said, Lord, I'll give you the tenth. He didn't have a tenth to give. He didn't have anything to give. But I'll give you the tenth. Twenty years later, he came back over that same ground. And the Bible said he was rich in rams and in cattle. He was rich as he came back that way. God had been with him. And really, we have to give God the praise for it and the glory. Consider Joseph tonight. Eight or ten years in prison, perhaps, and a slave at that. But as a teenager, back over there in Judea, he'd had some dreams and he saw some things happening. He saw his brothers bowing down before him. Joseph didn't have the power to make that happen. But that God up in heaven that made him dream those dreams and made him tell them about them knew that he was in prison and he knew where he was. There are a lot of folk in this world and I don't think God even knows they exist. But God knows where each and every solitary soul is on the face of this earth tonight. He knows where you dwell and he knows where you're going tonight. He knows the very intent of the heart and the thought of the mind at every given second of the day. How many of you got up this morning and combed your hair and took the, the loose hair that came out of your head and counted them and wrote it down in the book? Not many of you. Probably nobody. 
But God did. God said, the very hair of your head is numbered. You know, we do, we do God a disservice in not giving Him the praise for His thoughts of us. God's thinking of us tonight. God's looking down upon us tonight. God sees us here in this place tonight. Every heartache that's in anybody here tonight, there's a record in heaven of it right now. Every one of you that's ever been disappointed and right now that needs encouragement, God's got a record of it tonight. But a lot of folk come to church and leave and go home and never get delivered. They think, well, God didn't see their need. I'm persuaded to believe tonight that a man can have what he'll have faith for. I'm persuaded to believe tonight that through faith all things are possible to them that believe. I believe tonight that it's possible and Joseph never gave up hope. He came into part of his house. God blessed everything part of her had. He gave him everything into his hand except his wife. And she double-crossed him. Potiphar came home and took him out and put him in a prison. He never got bitter over it. Didn't hate anybody for it. Went down in that prison in that stinking dungeon down below the surface of the earth. In a place in my mind it was dank and dark. But the Bible said that he found favor with the keeper of the prison. Why? Because God is unlimited. So if I would have been, if I would have been Joseph, well, I'd have done this and I'd have done that. But I'll tell you what Joseph did. He found favor with his Lord. He knew how to get in touch with his God. And that person, that person keeper, when Joseph came in, he just couldn't help it. There was no way that he could resist Joseph. There was something about the power of God that said, put this boy over everybody in this prison. And Joseph was made the prison keeper. Why? Not because he'd been trained by Pharaoh's staff. Not because he had favor with the Egyptian empire. But simply because he had favor with a God that was unlimited. God brought him before the king. And God gave him the prime ministership of that country. And I'd like to say tonight that God's ability is connected with his willingness to do something for his own. God has tremendous ability. There's nothing that has ability like God has. There's no ability that exists like the ability of God. And that ability tonight is directly correct connected with the willingness to do for anybody that's people of God. And let me say another thing. He loved us before we got here. There are no limitations in getting things from God. Everybody say, no limitations. No. Say it again. No limitations. 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 Somebody tells you you can't do it because you, what your name is because of the family you've been reared in, because of the vicinity of the country you live in, because of your education, no matter what they tell you, there are no limitations with God on your ability for God to bless you as He desires to do. God can choose anything He wants to, and He's chosen some peculiar things. I have to confess it tonight. He let Moses use a rod to part the waters of the Red Sea with. Now isn't that a, isn't that quite a thing? Isn't that something to think about parting a Red Sea? And you, all you're going to use is a rod. Nothing else, just a rod. That's all he used. But there's something in that little rod that when he stretched it over the water, that the water parted. And they walked across on dry ground. I read where one commentator said that what they actually did, that... They waded through the mud that there came a strong wind and it blew the water back. And when the water was blown back, it was sort of muddy. And they waded through it and made it through to the other side. And then the Egyptians thought they could get through with their chariots. And they came off and the chariots were heavy. And they bogged down in the mire. I actually read that in a commentary. And I had to laugh about it. Some people didn't know such a little bit about God. And yet they can write such great books when that little rod reached out over the water. And the power of the unlimited God came down the water. 
Praise God, it wasn't wet. It was not a mud hole. It was dry ground, and the Bible said not even the sole of their foot was wet. Why? Because he is God unlimited. He is God unlimited. And then God chose another peculiar weapon. Samson had a little battle on his hand, and he needed a weapon, and he couldn't reach a sword real quick. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the bones of cattle and horses and things that have died, but I've seen them. As I was a really boy, we had a lot of cattle, and we had some bog holes, and it was nothing unusual to go around a bog hole where an old cow had bogged down and stayed there and died before anybody could get to her. And you could see every bone in her body there, bleached out, lying around the water hole. And you could see her backbone, and you could see the leg bone, and you could see the jaw bone. And there wasn't any sword nearby. So Samson was moved upon to the power of the unlimited God, and he just reached out and picked up the jaw bone of a mule. And he just waded into those Philistines, and he slew them left and right, and he won the battle. It was not the weapon, it was not the man, it was the unlimited God that lived within the man. We pride ourselves a lot of times on things we've learned. I wouldn't give you five cents for an education. Brother, if you don't have God, the education won't get you 12 inches off of this ground. We're going to have to have the power of God that fell at Pentecost. And if we don't have it, we haven't got enough. We've got to have the set the word of God all of the power of God. Oh, hallelujah. We can't make it on man's wisdom. and seen people try to bring us in the way of the Lord by their own teaching and admission through different denominations and one thing and another, but it won't do it. You've got to have the power of God that brought Jesus out of the grave. Hallelujah. Who ever heard of a man taking five smooth stones and winning a battle with it? Who ever heard of a man going up against uh, almost impossible odds and he didn't even have anything to fight with? All he had was a little old sling. That's all in the world he had. Went into the king and he said, you can't go out there to fight without anything. Come here, son. Let me put my armor on you and take my sword. And Saul put his armor on him, and he had him his sword, and he felt so out of place, he didn't know what to do with it. Let me tell you something. We are not denominational minded. We are not a denomination. And don't you tell anybody we are. We are the church of the living God with power unlimited. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I say again, we're not a denomination. We are blood bought. We're spirit-filled. We wear the name of our Lord. We're a peculiar people. We're a chosen priesthood. And God's got us here to set his favor upon us. He'll fight our battles. He'll win our victories. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I'm preaching about God. Unlimited. And we've got a generation today that's got God hogtied and they've got him over in a corner and they've got shackles on his legs and shackles on his hands. I want to tell you tonight, you can't shackle my God. He's alive. Oh, praise God. He's here tonight. Woo! Hallelujah. He's God forevermore. He's God unlimited. Hallelujah. Don't come here and tell me that God can't do anything. You got here too late to tell me. God is alive. God is real. God is unlimited. He said, sir, I've never used these things before. 
There's a lot of people going around tonight. They're trying to use a lot of things, a lot of tools that someone else gave them that God doesn't have a thing in this world to do with. When we get away from the basics, and when I say basics, I mean repentance. I mean staying away from sin. I mean living for God and let the divine power of God lead us and guide us and keep us. Let me tell you another thing. Our dollar is so close on this world until it's breathing down the throats and the backs of Pentecostal people tonight. Yes, sir. You know what our dollar is? It's a love or veneration for anything more than you have for God. I don't see how anybody can say they love God when they spend most of their time doing something they enjoy in the flesh. There is a time of denial. You go through the Bible. You'll never find a man that did anything for God that didn't deny himself something. We've got to deny ourselves some pleasures in this world. We've got to say no to sin and the devil and take a stand for the truth and fight it to the end. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be looking for an easy street in the Pentecostal church. I'm not. I don't want an easy street. I don't want something that I can't use for God. If I can't use it for God, I don't want it. There's a lot of people got their minds set on a good retirement and a big social security check when they retire. If that thing's not already bankrupt, it will be by the time I get old enough to retire. I'm not looking to social security. I'm not trusting in social security. I'm trusting in an unlimited God tonight. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, it's time that we back up and take a survey of where we're at and what we're doing and how we're living and see what means more to us than it does to serve God. Come on, Elder. Come on, Elder. Come on, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, I can't wear them. I can't wear them. I don't know what to do with them. Amen. The thing is, we need to get in touch with God. He said, I know. I know what to do. He said, I know what to fight with. I know the thing that'll work for me. He said, just take these back. I'll use proven weapons. Proven weapons. Hallelujah. What was it that worked for the apostles? It was fasting and prayer. It was communion with each other. It was loving each other. It was trusting in the name of the living God. It was walking with God every day. It was going from house to house and knocking on doors and telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people today are using weapons that have never been proven. And I'd like to recount something to us tonight. When Jesus Christ left this world, I want to remind you of this, and I want you to write it down and sign it. If you think you'll forget it, don't forget what I'm fixing to tell you tonight. When Jesus left this world, he left everything he died for in the hands of 11 men. Brother, they didn't own a plot of land. They didn't have a bank account. They didn't have a loan from the federal savings and loan. They didn't have favor with the mayor. They didn't have any rich folks that's going to finance them. All they had was a promise. Think about it. They didn't even have the Holy Ghost. All they had was a promise. Just a promise. He said, I'll send the comforter back. And when the comforter comes, he'll speak for himself. And he'll testify of me. That's all they had was a promise. And they went over there and stayed. But I want to tell you what, from 11 men until now, it brought down the power of mighty Rome. It covered all of Asia. It covered all of Europe. It put down empires. It put down rulers. And it crossed the seas. And it's come to the shores of America. And the power of the living God is unlimited. <laughs> Hallelujah. They didn't have to have a television to get people saved. They didn't have to have a radio. They didn't have to have a newspaper. They had the unlimited God. <laughs> Hallelujah. But uh, we're trying to make excuses for ourselves and say, if, 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 I want to tell you tonight, if we believe in the unlimited God, God can do for us what he did for them. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Oh, hallelujah. I'm preaching about God. I'm limited. Some folks say, well, if I had what so-and-so's got, I could do this. I could have a big church. I walked into man I worked for one day. And I was over the poultry division of a feed company. Had a lot of men working under me and was very busy. Had two million laying hens on feed and I don't know how many ball brawlers. 35 full-time servicemen working for me. And I was so busy in pastoring a church, a little church, trying to bring it up and build it. He looked at me and he said, McCoy, sales manager did. He said, how many sermons do you preach a week? I said, well, I never preach less than four. A lot of weeks I preach eight. He said, when do you get your sermons to preach? I said, I get them as I'm driving along the road praying between one customer and another. All right, night after I've gotten home, midnight hours. Sometime I was on the road 24 hours a day and didn't get to sleep. But I never found a time that God wasn't there. And he said, you don't have any trouble having something to preach when you get there? I said, no, sir. I never have. He said, well, you know, that's a funny thing. Our pastor has been preaching two sermons a week. And he just told us at our last stewards meeting that he couldn't preach two sermons anymore. One was all he could possibly preach in a week because it took him a whole week to get one sermon. And he said, you know, he said, we sent this, uh, our organization sent this boy to seminary. He has a degree and then he has a doctor's degree from seminary. And he should be intelligent enough. I said, do you suppose, I said, do you suppose he has to have that to be a preacher of the Lord? He said, well, we require it. You can't be a preacher in our organization without it. I said, do you suppose the apostle Peter could have passed the exam to have gotten in to have been your pastor? He said, I'll have to think about that a little bit. I said, now he didn't have a degree, but I'll tell you what he did have. He had favor with Jesus Christ. He had favor with the Lord. I said, he could lay his hands on people and they'd start speaking in tongues. He could pray over people that hadn't walked in all their lives with their bones broken and twisted and crooked in every way and they'd jump up and start walking and leaping and jumping and praising God. He began to shuffle papers around on his desk. He said, well, I really appreciate what you told me. When I left that company, they told me, said, I'll tell you this, if you ever want a job, as long as you live, you've got one here. Brother, you can stand for God and preach the truth, and the Lord will always be with you. His brother, who was in the company, died a few years later of cancer. They sent me word to Port Arthur and asked me to come to Nacogdoches. I got in my car and drove to Nacogdoches, and he had laughed at me at times about my stand for God. He asked me one time, we had about a million pullets for sale, and I didn't have a place for them to go. He said, I want to know how you're going to sell these pullets. I said, I'm going to pray to God. He got mad and stopped out of the office. He said, I never heard of such a stupid thing. A man at the salesman is praying that God's going to sell his merchandise for him. About a month later, he came in and said, how many pullets we got left? I said, not any. He stopped me looking and said, not any. I said, no, sir. He said, where'd they go? I said, I sold them all. He said, how'd you do it? I said, God, help me. Brother, God does not despise small things. God wants us to recognize Him. God wants us to praise Him. God wants us to love Him. It's time we start praising God with our family. We need to praise God with our job. When a man gets up in the morning and goes to work, he may not like his job. You may think, oh, it's going to be so boring today. That old boss of mine is so overbearing and so hateful. Can't hardly get along with him. You ought to get up in the morning and start thanking God that you're working with that man. God put you there in order for him to see your life. It's through you that he's going to be saved. God's going to talk to him and bring him to the house of God. Amen. Hallelujah. See, all I am is a ditch digger. That's all right. Go out there digging ditches and sing while you're digging ditches. Let the power of the Holy Ghost come on you. I had a man come to me not long ago. He said, I can't hardly stand to work on the job where I'm at. I hear, I hear such profanity and such vulgarity. I can't take it any longer. I said, I'll tell you what you do. 
from now on when you go to work and they start cursing you, just start saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I said, just make you a little quick and start cliche and start saying, my soul loves you, Jesus. My soul loves you, Jesus. My soul loves you, Jesus. He said, right on the job. I said, right on the job. Just give Jehovah praise fire. Give him the glory fire. And you know, he came back and he told me, he said, it works. It works. There's a lot of my God, the Lord of our God. And he said, brother, they stop saying it around me. Talking about the power of an unlimited God. He said, I'll just take my proven weapons. He went down across the ravine, picked up five smooth stones. He put one in that old sling, carried it around. Notice David has power. Notice I've learned in school, not because I'm a great soldier, but in the name of my Lord. Hallelujah. Let's don't ever open the door unless we do it in the name of Jesus. Let's not ever preach a sermon unless we do it in the name of Jesus. Let's not ever do it, make a move for God or do anything for God unless we do it in the name of the Lord. Because God wants that. He wants our adoration. He wants our love. He wants our recognition. And he wants us to walk with him every day. Hallelujah. Goliath fell down. He ran up and grabbed his sword and cut his head off. The Philistines fled. How does consider a crowd? Just depends on how you look at it. After, after Elijah's victory on Carmel, he got out and he began to pray. He told his seven, he said, go yonder and look toward the Mediterranean and see if you see anything. He came back, he said, I don't see anything. He said, go back and look again. He prayed again. He went two, three, four, five, six times. He came back six times and he said, I don't see anything. He got out and he began to pray. He said, what are you praying for? And no use to pray. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to come out of that. Well, my God gave me a promise and I haven't given up yet. I've prayed six times and nothing happened. I'm going to pray seven times. If it doesn't happen this time, I'll pray eight. I'll pray ten. I'll pray twenty. I'll pray fifty. I'll pray a hundred. Because I'm praying to an unlimited God. He went back the seventh time and he came back and he said, well, it's really not anything to get excited about. It's not anything to get upset over. It's nothing, nothing for you to let it uh, stir you up anyway. But he said, I saw a little old cloud out there about the size of a man's hand. Old Elijah was down praying. Well, it's about the size of a man's hand. Old Elijah jumped up and he said, what? He said, about the size of a man's hand. He said, get down there and tell Ahab to get in a hurry. He's going to get wet before he gets over to Jezreel. The power of thunder is in the air. <laughs> Hallelujah. Nobody else could see it, but he could see it. He could feel it. He believed it. I feel it tonight. I feel the power of the electrifying power of the mighty God in the midst of the United Pentecostal Church tonight. It's our revival if we we'll believe it. <laughs> hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And old Elijah came down from there. He got that old leather girdle. And he girded himself up. You know, those men wore those long, coarse, flowing robes. And it was hard to run with them down. And you'd take that old girdle and you could gird that thing up. And he would pull it up out of the ways of the knees. And, and a man could run. And he came down off of that mountain. And Ahab had started that horse and that chariot running. And he was running along there. And the rain was falling. And, and the dirt was uh, bouncing up as the rain was splattering it. And here as he looked, here came something around him and passed him by. Brother, it wasn't a freight train. It wasn't another horse and chariot. It was old Elijah, the prophet of the living God. Hallelujah. We undercut God. We sell God short. We try to limit God. We try to put him in a little category. I want to tell you tonight, you cannot categorize God. You hear me tonight. You can't put God in a category. God is God. And he won't be anything else. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 
You can't put him in a box. You can't put him in a house. You can't shut him in a building. You can't put him in a ship. You can't put him in anything in this world that's ever been built because God is so big. He's everywhere. And right now, he's especially right here. We're treading on holy ground tonight. I want you to know we're treading on holy ground tonight. We've got a God that's challenged us. We've got a God that's called us. We've got a God that said, come and follow me. Come and follow me and I'll show you the promised land. Come and follow me and I'll show you lands you've never seen. You know what God said to the church? He said, I'll give you my inheritance. And God's portion is his people. They belong to us. The biggest church in every town ought to be a Pentecostal church. And we get our 50 or our 100 or our 150 or 200 and and we're ready to sit down and take it easy. We're ready just to sit down and rock in a rocking chair and say, come Lord Jesus, I've got everything I need until you get here. Brother, we'll never get everybody saved in this world. We'll never get enough people saved in this world. We need to carry this gospel and we need to do it positively. And when you go and knock on a door, don't feel like that you're going to be mistreated. Feel like that God's going to work for you. God's going to talk for you. God's going to bring a revival in that house and in that community. God unlimited. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My brother-in-law, my wife's brother, just like a brother to me, one of the sweetest boys ever lived. He and I didn't know each other before we went to the service, hardly. I went to take him to town the night he had to leave for the army. He was a little older than me, he had to leave first. My wife and I were not married at that time. I saw him when when I was in England for a short while before the invasion of France. And we were together, and I've loved him. He's loved me. We've been very close over the years. Came back from the war. The first night I went to Pentecostal altar to seek God for the Holy Ghost, he was in the building, and I didn't know he came to the altar until the service was over. God filled me with the Holy Ghost, and he didn't receive it. Twenty years later from that day, I was back in the city of Lufkin, my hometown, preaching a revival. And Henry sat in the audience that night. He was still seeking the Holy Ghost, 20 years. Been going to church off and on, go to the altar and they'd pray with him. He'd get up and sit back on the pew and, and hang his head between his hands and feel sorry for himself and go home. Good boy, didn't do anything bad, but just didn't have the Holy Ghost, just didn't have God. And I preached the revival that night. He was sitting back on my left about a third of the way back. As I began to preach, came the conclusion of that message that night. Before I even finished it, I preached that night about a man taking 20 years to do a five-minute job. He had been seeking God 20 years. It only takes five minutes to receive the Holy Ghost. And if you really are, if you really are on your toes, you can do it quicker than that. Somebody said it takes a long time to repent. You know how long it took Saul of Tarsus to repent? The way I've got it figured, it took him about 30 seconds. He fell to the earth when that light hit him. And he heard the voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Yeah. I want you to listen to the very next words of Saul of Tarsus. He said, what would you have me to do, Lord? But that's repentance. When you get to the place, you can say, God, what do you want me to do? You're ready to do what God said. That old brother-in-law of mine jumped up and ran down that aisle. I'd never seen him do it in all of my life. He ran down that aisle and he fell in the altar. And he fell back on his back. And a little brother who was the son of my former pastor, a little young brother filled with the Holy Ghost, he just jumped right astraddle of him on his knees. 
And the next thing I knew, he was speaking in another tongue as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. Oh, God is unlimited. God is unlimited. God is unlimited. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Too long, too long, too long. We put God in a category. God doesn't fit a category. God fills everything. Had a man in my church had been going to the altar 24 years. Came to the altar and prayed the same way every time we had church. He'd pray a while and then he'd quit and he'd go sit on the front pew. Put his head down in his hands. Feel sorry for himself. Had him in the altar. We had another man in the altar that had been going to the altar probably 20 years. He was 65 years old. Had a lady in the altar, been going to the altar 10 years. Had a boy in the altar, reared in the Pentecostal home, been in the altar all of his life. None of them had the Holy Ghost. None of them had the Holy Ghost. Melvin Mayfield walked up that night to the altar and prayed just like he always did and went back and sat down. I walked over and I said, Brother Mayfield, he looked at me. I said, do you want the Holy Ghost? He said, that's what I came up here for. I said, are you willing to die for it tonight? I said, you'd be better to die receiving the Holy Ghost tonight and then going to heaven than you would living a hundred years and going to hell. He got up off that pew and walked across to where I was standing. Lifted his hands, tears began to stream down his face. I laid my hand on his head and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. Twenty-four years to do a one-minute job. God is unlimited. We are the ones that limit God. God has unlimited power. It's because of our unbelief that things don't happen. And I'm here to tell you tonight, there's not much unbelief going to be here in about five minutes. Hallelujah. I want you to begin right now to tell that old devil of unbelief, get out of my way. Get out of here. Hallelujah. Shapala kariandala mahasa. Oh, Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what the unbelieving devil is, whether it's unbelief for revival in your church, whether it's unbelief for a building, whether it's unbelief for your healing, whether it's unbelief for the Holy Ghost, no matter what it is, it's got to go. I want you to start right now helping me to believe that all unbelief has got to leave this building. Hallelujah. Bruce Grimsley was a 65-year-old man, been going to the altar all of his adult life, I suppose, off and on. The wife was a great saint in the church. Children had had the Holy Ghost and were backslid. Came up to me one night in revival. I said, Brother McCoy, would you pray for me tonight? I said, not now, but pray for me after you go home or before you leave the church. I said, what do you want me to pray for? He said, I'm not hungry for the Holy Ghost. I've been going to the altar nearly all my life. I live a good life. It put a lot of people's lives in the shade. A lot of folks do things that my mother would turn over in her grave if I did. But he said, I'm not hungry for the Holy Ghost. I've been going to the altar because I believe it's real, but I'm not hungry for it. I'm not really wanting it. I said, yes, sir, I'll pray for you. Everybody left, and I turned every light off in the building except that little light right up over the pulpit. It was the center of Texas, just a little frame church at that time, sealed inside and out with wood. I knelt down there and began to pray. I guess I prayed 30, 40 minutes. And God spoke to me and said, I've heard you. I got up and went home, went to bed, and went to sleep. Thought no more about it. The next evening I came to church and started to open the service. He came up and he said, could I speak to you a minute? And I said, yes, sir. He said, last night I asked you to pray for me. He said, preacher, I've never had a headache in my life. I'm 65 years old. He said, I've never gone to bed in my life that I wasn't asleep in one minute. I could go to sleep the moment I hit the bed. Never did I worry about anything. 
He said, last night I went home and I prepared for bed just like I always do. And the moment I laid down on that mattress, a voice spoke to me and said, Bruce, you're lost. If you die tonight, you're going to hell. He said, I didn't sleep a wink all night and I haven't slept a wink all day. I'm ready for the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In about 10 minutes, he was speaking in tongues. Took a whole lifetime to do a 10-minute job. God is unlimited. You hear me tonight? I said, God is unlimited. There's some of you sitting here saying tonight, you need things from God you haven't got. You know why? Because you've been limiting God. You've been putting God in a category, and God doesn't want that. God wants you to trust Him and to believe Him, and God wants you to accept the Holy Word of God and stand upon it. Hallelujah. And I haven't got time to tell of all of them. Time is gone. I've been up here almost an hour and I've got to close. But I've seen so many drug addicts come through our church. Some of them did not get delivered, but most of them did. Almost every one of them that have come through our church, and it's been literally hundreds since I've been in Port Arthur. Not all of them were in our church. They were in the surrounding churches. We've got several churches in the area. They're all around us. But most of them, for the most part, received the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues at the altar. And all except a very small minority that didn't get it there, when they were baptized, they came out of the water speaking in tongues. Now that's the promise of God. God said repent and be baptized and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. And James said, when you pray over the sick and anoint them with oil and pray for them, God will raise the sick up and forgive their sins. Let's go to the Bible. Let's not let the world sell us a bill of goods tonight. Too long we've been deceived by the world. Too long we've been deceived by theologians. We don't need a theologian. We need the power of the unlimited God. Skipper Dago was on every kind of drug you can think of. But tonight he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He never wanted another cigarette. He never wanted another shot in his arm. He never wanted another pill. God delivered him then and there. I could name you dozens of them. Some of them on heroin that were baptized, received the Holy Ghost, and never wanted another fix. You say, I don't believe it. I want to tell you, the unlimited God can do anything we're believing for. God unlimited. God I'm closing in about two or three minutes. I want to just share something with you. In our world, the coloring of a swallowtail butterfly is caused by 750,000 brilliant scales spread evenly over his wing. You've seen them. Beautiful butterfly with all those gorgeous colors. On that little single wing, there are 750,000 scales that God put there. When he sails through the air, the iridescence is reflected in the brilliance of the sunlight. And we look at it and don't really appreciate it. That's the power of the unlimited God that we're serving tonight. But God put you here and in your body tonight. You have over 300 chemical reactions that science has never been able to duplicate. Brother, doctors do not understand over 300 chemical things in your body. They don't know what to do to regulate them. Who keeps us going? The unlimited God. He'll give you that church building you need. 
He will deliver you from drugs. If you're here tonight and you're on drugs, if you're filled with the lust of the world, God will set you free tonight. If you're having trouble living a victorious life, God will come down and make you as beautiful, more beautiful than that butterfly, if you'll just let him. And then there was that old prophet Elijah. And I see him. He was over by the brook Cherith. He was running out of water. He drank the last there was. It's all gone. God said, Elijah, I want you to get up and I want you to go to Zarephath. He said, there's a widow woman living over there and I've ordered her to sustain you. So you go over there. I see old Elijah on his way. I want you to, I want you to say God unlimited. I want you to say it again, God unlimited. How many of you believe it with me right now? I want you to get ready to let the power of God move on you tonight. I want you to get ready to receive what God's got for you tonight. You that need the Holy Ghost, when I tell you to come receive the Holy Ghost, don't come waiting for somebody to pray for you. Get up with your arms outstretched, come down that aisle and be speaking in tongues by the time you get to the front. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't be afraid of anything. There's no devil big enough to prevent it from happening. Hallelujah. I'm talking about God unlimited tonight. I'm talking about God unlimited. No matter what it is you need for God, immediately following those men and women that want the Holy Ghost, you come with them to receive whatever you need from God and to pray with them that they'll receive it. I see a woman walk out of the house. She looks across the field and she sees an old bedraggled man come in across the field and has on an old man that's moth-eaten. She lifts her eyes and she sees him. She goes about her business picking up sticks. The old man walks up to her. He's got an old shaggy beard. He's been hit out over there on that brook a long time. Been away from civilization. Ravens have been feeding him. He walked up to her and he said, Lady, go in the house and bake me a cake that I can eat something. I'm Elijah the prophet. She looked at him and she said, Sir, I'm sorry. Now remember, God has said, I've already told her to sustain you. I'm sorry, I've just got enough meal and oil for just me and my son, and I'm fixing to bake that, and we're going to eat that and die because we're starving to death. There's no rain in the land. We can't live here. Can't live here. There's no way we can live here. He said, oh, you go on in there and do what I tell you. You go in there and do what I'm telling you to do because I'm hungry, and I've got to eat. And he said, I'll tell you another thing. If you go in there and do what I'm saying... I promise you the meal won't fail in that barrel and the oil won't fail in that cruise until rain falls from heaven upon the land because my God is unlimited. She went in there and she looked over in that barrel and there's a pitiful little bit in there. Wasn't very much. She reached down there with her dipper and she got every bit to what? She got it all. She brought it up. She got that cruise and wasn't much in it. She turned it bottom side up. She emptied every bit she had in there. She set it in the oven and she turned the fire on. And brother, it began to bake. The aroma of it came out in the kitchen. That little boy could smell it. She could smell it. Oh, she was hungry. Her stomach was telling her, I'm hungry. The little boy's eyes were watering. Oh, I'm fixing to get to eat. She reached in and she got it. She dumped it out on the platter and she picked it up. It looked so good. She took it out and she handed it to him and she said, Here it is, Elijah. Elijah took it. It was still hot. It smelled so good. It smelled so good. He said, Jehovah God, I thank you now because your power is unlimited. You're supplying me with what I need. You're keeping your promise. And Lord, as soon as I eat this, she can go in and cook her a cake. Sure was good. 
she watched him and when the last bite was gone she dashed back in that chicken then that house 